<laughs> so, so maybe just before, uh, you know, um, Uh, just before uh, I continue, I just want to kind of clarify this talk that this point that uh, in discussion with Nati, I wanted to make sure that uh, this point that uh, what, what the different people care about different regimes. So, so to a first approximation, basically, if you are a, a statistical physicist. then you uh, only care about, uh, uh, you care about this point, but you don't care about what happens be, be beyond it because you only care, you, your basic case is, uh, you know, random problems. Uh, maybe you started talking about, you know, inference, uh, but, uh, but you really care about random system, like standard statistical system uh, uh, systems that, uh, and you care when, when there are no longer solution, there is no landscape anymore. From this point on, all of them look the same. So to a first approximation, if you're a statistical physicist, you only care about this part. Now, if you're, uh, if you're uh, you know, theoretical uh, machine learning, you know, generally machine learning or at least theoretical and you're in interested in the inference, then this part generally doesn't interest you because this red part, which is what the statistical physicists care most, most about, this is just noise. You really care about things uh, on the uh, on the right side, so you really care about the this line. When do things become, say, computationally easy? Uh, so, so uh, to some extent, uh, you know, one part really cares about this regime, one part cares about this regime. But the interesting thing is that you can still use the same type of algorithm. So, for example, you could use gradient descent or local algorithms. You can use it to try to do inference and and recover the signal. But you can also do use it even if there is no signal. You can all use it here to try to recover, you know, to minimize the ground state. So it's the same algorithm, uh, but in some sense you're trying to do something very, very different. Here you're trying to recover the ground state, uh, or uh, you know, a, a random ground state. Maybe there are may many of them. But from the point of view of someone trying to do inference, this is just recovering the noise. It's some sense not interesting, and you could not recover the signal because there's simply more noise than signal. But uh, from the point of view of statistical physicists, that's really still very interesting to try uh, to find the ground state. From the point of view of, uh, you know, if uh, someone does the inference, you care here about trying to recover the signal. But, uh, you know, from uh, the point of view of statistical physics, the problem had become trivial long, long ago. So if you think of, for example, of the, um, this problem PXOR, then this line will generally be roughly n to the uh, delta is uh, n to the uh, p over two minus one. So for example, for uh, CX, so this is basically you have uh, n to the 1.5 constraints. This is way, way out there beyond uh, the problem is no longer satisfiable. And uh, so, so these are kind of different regimes, but I really hope that eventually we'll find a unified picture that uh, gets both of them because we do seem to use similar algorithms so I, um, but so I, so I really hope that uh, eventually we'll get uh, a unified picture. Okay, so now I hope we'll, we'll start doing a, a little bit of math, at least to uh, feed the, the appetites of those that had enough of uh, graphs and figures and uh, and philosophy and, <laughs> and uh, wants to get what, what they came here for. So uh, right, so we are looking at this PXO problem. And we want to show that say PXO problem for uh, three and above, or at least something like that. Let, let's say uh, we'll focus on four maybe, but uh, is actually hard. So let, we want to look at hardness for local algorithms. So what is a local algorithm? We are not going to completely locally uh, define it, but here is the general idea of what is local or generalized local algorithms. Even some algorithms that are not exactly local kind of fall under this uh, the, this general umbrella. So we are looking at an algorithm to try to solve the search problem. So an algorithm that uh, gives given J and the goal is to find a minimizer for J or at least something that's close as, as possible to a minimizer. And generally these type of local algorithms have the following form. They start by initializing X zero to some value 
that is independent of j. Maybe it's random, maybe it's zero, it's something, some value that is independent of j, and then do a sequence of local improvements. So for t equals one, two, three, etc., we keep we we uh, x t is going to be x t minus one, and we make some local improvement. What is the local improvement? We uh, we uh, we look at nabla, some function of uh, our instance j, the previous state. Maybe sometimes we also look at some even more previous states or some other, you know, maybe also the current uh, the current position. And we uh, make this local uh, update. And the idea is that uh, for it to be a local algorithm, you can basically say any algorithm you can kind of phrase in this way, but we, uh, we want to restrict ourselves to somehow simple local al updates. And I'm not going to completely define what is simple and local, but generally simple should be some kind of a simple function, maybe a low degree polynomial, or maybe you know some gradient or something like that of a, of the input, you know, the J and the, the prior state. And sometimes you also look, you know, say for example, in AMP, you look at some of some previous states as well. And, and in gradient descent, for example, you have like a learning rate schedule. So you also, you know, it's some function also of the current step that you're in, but some kind of a simple function. And local means that we're not going to make big changes. So generally XT is close to XT minus one. So this is the general framework of local algorithms. And typically in these local algorithms, I kind of presented it sequentially, but you can also perform these changes in batch in parallel. You can take like a bunch of, uh, you can kind of pre-compute this delta uh, and, and uh, based on uh, the pre-compute a bunch of these deltas and make all of these things uh, in parallel. And generally the parallel depth of these algorithms typically is just a function of accuracy. So many of the local algorithms that we look at like AMP, et cetera, Generally, they just keep like O of N memory and, and, and they can do O of N updates in parallel. So they only need like O of one iterations where this O of one depends on whatever accuracy you want to achieve. But then I, this is the idea of local algorithms. We are, we'll, we'll see what property we kind of use uh, for local algorithms. But so there is a lot of, there, there, there is a lot of work of showing that uh, the overlap gap property so this, this overlap distribution, when it has a gap, which basically means it's, um, it's kind of in this clustering regime, then it's a barrier for local algorithms and also for some other types of algorithms. And, and there is a lot of work, probably this is only uh, even a partial list. There are a, a number of people uh, in that are in the room, and especially uh, you can see that the name Gamarnik kind of appears uh, quite a lot in this uh, overlap uh, uh, overlap gap property works. And so I hope that uh, he will forgive me because I'm probably going to butcher his work a little bit. Uh, I mean, in terms of like presenting a very simplified and cartoon version uh, in, a, in a slide or two, but I hope it will give the general uh, idea. And you, you feel free to, connect, to correct me. You're forgiven the fraud. I've forgiven the fraud, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's remember what is this overlap distribution. So we had this picture and we had this overlap distribution. This is the distribution of the overlap between two random, uh, say, minimizers. So think of P star as the uniform distribution over minimizers. And and we have this uh, overlap distribution. Let's, yeah, I should have really put this with absolute value, but doesn't really matter. So, so in general, in the in the easy case, the uh, in the easy case, you kind of have the the, the, the there is no overlap gap. The, you kind of have a a, a general. Um, you 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 have a general. Um, it's kind of an interval the support, and in fact. If uh, you know in high dimensions you expect that two random things will be nearly orthogonal, so you basically have uh, um, the full interval. And in the hard case, you have some kind of uh, an overlap gap. You have some pair, uh, you know, A B, uh, such that there is never uh, there does not exist x one and x two in the support, such that the x one x two Let's suppose they are unit vectors just to, to is in a b so here is uh, some intuition and the intuition is based on the four spin model i 
think by the way, U, U paper is on the four spin model, but probably something similar should be true also for three spin. Verify that. You're not able to verify, but the conjecture that is true, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so, the, so they looked at the paper. They looked at the uh, the case where it's a four-spin model and the coefficients are uh, normal. And here is a cartoon of the proof. So, the, 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 this is a proof that local algorithms, um, when there is the overlap gap property, local algorithms cannot uh, cannot find the the maximizer. And here is a cartoon of the proof. And of course, I didn't completely define local, but you'll see what property of local algorithms I need. So let's assume for the sake of contradiction that there is some local algorithm A such that if you give a, a J as input, it finds X star that is in the support of this distribution. Um, so the support of the minimizers. And now let's define for uh, say for T, which is between zero and one, Let's define the uh, JT to be, you, you know, uh, the combination of uh, J prime and J double prime, where J prime and J double prime are two independent tensors. And this combination is chosen so that, uh, you know, its coefficient is still a, a standard normal. So uh, J zero is just J prime. Uh, so J one is J prime and J uh, zero is a J double prime. Okay, so now, oops, let's see. So now let's draw the following thing. So uh, if you uh, run, uh, say, let's track the, uh, this A gets as input J and outputs a vector. So let's just say that uh, when you give it J zero, you get X of zero. So that's so define x of t as the vector that is output by a on input j t. And so x one is a on j one, and x uh, uh, and x zero is a on uh, j zero. And generally, uh, for any t, x t is uh, what a outputs on j t. And a, of course, can be a randomized algorithm. But let's say we fix the randomness. We chose a, some certain randomness and fixed it. Now let's track the dot product. And again, maybe I should have done this thing, but the absolute value, but doesn't matter so much, uh, of uh, xt and x1. So because this is uh, uh, obviously uh, x1 and x1 have dot, dot product one. So obviously uh, uh, xt equals x1. So the dot product will be one. And if you there's two kind of random uh, there are two random tensors, then the dot product of the output should, uh, for j and j, j prime and j double prime should be, uh, basically they should be orthogonal. So this starts at zero and ends at one. And now the property that we use of locality and the property that Gamalnik and uh, Jagannath will prove is that because it's local, this is going to be continuous. So this is going to be some curve that starts with zero and ends with one. So definitely at some point, it's going to cross. It's going to cross in this interval a, a b, and now they uh, they prove in some sense. I think actually that part they maybe conjecture, but uh, I don't know. Maybe it's been proven already that you have a very strong overlap gap property, which is not only that uh, not only the support of q. So uh, that they, basically this is true even uh, even if you look at say you define this. Um, uh, X1 comes from some T and X2 uh, comes from some T prime uh, from the, uh, so these come from PT and these come from a PT prime for any T and T prime in zero one. So it's some kind of an extend, extension of this overlap gap distribution that even then you don't find any dot, any pair that have their dot product in this interval. And so once you do that, you get a contradiction, right? So you, there is, must be some T star so that uh, xt star and x1, their, their dot product is in this forbidden interval, which contradicts the overlap gap property. So that's basically the assumption. And the point where you use the fact that uh, A is local is in this continuity. That basically, as you vary, the vector doesn't go in, uh, if you slightly vary the coefficients of j, uh, of j as you change t smoothly, then the vector is not suddenly going to jump from one place to the other. Is that like a fair cartoon? Yeah, it's there. And the conjecture that you mentioned about Mark uh, uh, results. 
So Mark proved it. Well, there's a version of it on the on the hypercube versus the, the yes. Boolean cube, and uh, there was some something to be closed uh, and Mark. Uh, what was stated as a conjecture in the paper was uh, was closed. Yeah. Yes. So let me add. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So now it's no longer a conjecture. Okay, so so this is so this is a cartoon, but you can see how the overlap graph property implies a computational hardness. Yes. The property of overlap graph for all t, or does it do it for some small t? So we proved it for that for all t. So so basically, for with high probability over j prime and j double prime. For every uh, pair uh, T, uh, T1 and T2, there is not going to be, uh, say, an, an approximate minimizer for J prime and approximate, minim sorry, approximate minimizer of J T prime and uh, approximate minimizer of J T double prime, that the dot product is in this forbidden interval, right? Yeah, that's correct. In fact, T prime equal to T double prime is the, is the, uh, is the bottleneck, because once you perturb the model, even a little bit, the chances of having two near optimal solutions with the prescribed distance goes down. So when t is equal to t, t uh, prime, that's that's the what you really care about. Right. And the rest is more or less straightforward. Right. And when t equals to t prime is exactly the situation which statistical physicists have studied to get the f and they understand why the overlap property holds. So in some sense, the hard case is the case that's also the most well studied. So, so this is basically shows uh, if you have overlap, the problem should be hard. And now let's let's talk about why when you, you don't have overlap, the problem should be easy. So in, in general, there are kind of two reasons why the, the you should you might be without overlap. So one reason, one scenario is this scenario that I drew before. This is the replica symmetric scenario. Well, essentially all your solutions are kind of living in one big cluster or ball. And that's kind of intuitively easy. And then you have this overlap when you have this, uh, what you call one replica symmetry breaking, you, it breaks into clusters. So in some sense, instead of having like this, the solutions don't really live, like in, they, they live in these, you know, uh, several uh, clusters. But in general, you could even have these clusters break themselves into subclusters and subclusters. Now, if you can kind of continue this, uh, uh, you continue this uh, like a number of times that uh, goes to, you know, goes to infinity with the size of the system, that's what's called full replica sy symmetry breaking. So in full replica symmetry breaking, the intuition is that the, uh, you have clusters and then you have subclusters and then you have sub subclusters. And generally every solution it's eventually, uh, uh, you know, if you had, uh, say, D choices for the first cluster, D is a bad term, let's recall it, I don't know, C choices for the first cluster, I don't know, C1, C2 choices for the second cluster, et cetera. So uh, a solution, you can kind of parameterize it by, you know, which, uh, which choice you made in the first case, uh, I don't know, I1, I, I2, I, I3, et cetera, and, and the depth of it is, say, D. So it's kind of like every solution is, uh, every cluster is, you can think of it as a leaf of some tree and different solutions. Uh, I mean, the, every, every sub, 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 smaller cl cluster is basically some leaf of this tree. And in this case, uh, you can think of X as basically, uh, another way to think about it is that X has this component. So first by choosing whether, you know, it's in which cluster you kind of chose one of several choices of, what will be X1. This X1 is basically the vector that's contribution from the first cluster, the second cluster, et cetera, and up to the diff cluster. And if you have X and X prime, then the distance between them is basically proportional uh, to how in their distance in the tree, what's the nearest common ancestor. If the nearest common ancestor is uh, you know, close, then they're nearby. If it's far, uh, far then they're farther away. And when you have a metric that corresponds to the distance on the tree, it's called an ultrametric. So this is in, in a full replica symmetry breaking. This is kind of a situation where the solution geometry doesn't look like what I said before. It's neither one ball, nor is it like some disjoint clusters. And, but the interesting thing is that 
If you think about it in the full replica symmetry breaking, the overlap is actually uh, continuous. Because in some sense, you can think of a, you know, you can think of like you basically are choosing the first digit of the overlap and then the second, you know, this is, a, you can think of it as, a, um, suppose all of the C's were the same, then in some sense, the overlap is a random number, a fraction that expressed in the CRE basis. You know, you feel, this chooses the first digit of this uh, overlap and then this chooses the second digit. So that would be like a uniform. And generally, it doesn't have to be uniform, but uh, it's going to be continuous because this uh, because the depth goes to infinity so this is the case where there is no overlap so the intuition may be that if there is no overlap the problem should be easy and that's basically um, is believed to be the case and i think there was like some more works that i know of but let me mention that's just a, a, a few recent works that basically have shown that in some very interesting scenarios where there is no overlap gap then uh, there, is, uh, there is actually a, a polynomial time algorithm. And in fact, an algorithm that is kind of local, that's basically uh, along the lines that we've seen before. So the type of algorithm that would be ruled out when there is an overlap gap. So these works, so basically, uh, so Buck did it for something called as the mixed uh, spherical uh, P-spin. Now I did it for the Sherrington Kirkpatrick. And then you guys did it for more general. What's the family? Or how do you, would you call this the whole family? It's all P spins or? I think it's also mixed P spins. It can be unmixed. Yeah, yeah, like they, they, they did it for maybe the, the, uniform, the, the, the general generalization, the common generalization of that which basically took at all mixed, so you generalize it in two, you know, you, you allow mixtures and you allow both spherical and over the Boolean cube. So Shelton Kirkpatrick is like P equals two and over uh, the cube, and this one's over the sphere. And then you basically generalize it to all of those, uh, the, the common uh, unified generalization. So what is the mix, well, the easiest problem, at least for me, the easiest thing to describe is Subag. So I'm gonna focus on Subag on the result of Subag. So the mixed uh, spherical P-spin model, the idea is you have some mixture of these, uh, say, tensors. So you think of uh, uh, J of X is you, you have some coefficient gamma two times the dot product of J two and uh, X tensor two. So this is like just a matrix and some, you know, X I J, X I X J and the corresponding coefficient I J. And this is, uh, you know, gamma three and this three tensor, you, uh, some i, j, k, x, i times x, j times x, k, and you can continue onwards. Though I'm, for simplicity on the slides, I'm only gonna look at the two and three coefficients. And generally we are looking at, at the case where we maximize or minimize over the unit sphere, where, you know, norm of x is one. And the, the, um, the, no, the entries of the, these tensors are IID in, in a, a standard normal with a, normals with a variance one over N. Just a normalization, so, which makes life easier. So uh, let's define this uh, uh, polynomial, this univariate polynomial nu, uh, nu of Q, which is sum of gamma P squared uh, Q to the P. So basically, uh, gamma two squared Q squared plus gamma three squared Q cubed plus. Now you can do the math and see that uh, say, um, if, you, uh, if you fix X and you vary, you take J to be a random uh, normal with these entries, then J of X will be, uh, will be a, a, a standard normal. For, so for every fixed X, if the randomness is over J, this will be a normal with a variance, which is new one over N. Okay, and this is you know, just calculations, just because the sum of normals is a normal and the variances add up, independent normals. Uh, so it uh, sums up to this. And uh, if you look at, uh, X and X prime, then the uh, expectation of, over J of J of X times J of X prime is, uh, uh, is new app applied to the dot product divided by N. 
And again, this is just, you do the math and it comes out. So these are uh, the set, um, the set J, uh, you know, these random variables J of X for uh, all X in the sphere. It's like a Gaussian process, uh, call uh, uh, Gaussian random variables where this kind of determines, this new parameter new determines their correlations. Now the theorem of Subag, this is what, uh, this is the theorem of Subag shows that uh, there is a, a polynomial time algorithm that with high probability over J achieves this value. So let's ignore for every epsilon, so let's ignore the epsilon. So basically output a string, uh, 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 output something that achieves this value, uh, which is the uh, minimum of this integral of square root of the second derivative of new. So let's, the, the important thing about this value is that there was a previous theorem of Chen and Sen, and the physicists have known it actually way before then, that if you have the case where there is no overlap, then this is actually, this value is actually the true minimum of the, uh, the system. This is the, the ground state, or the, this is the, the minimum and uh, the minimum, the true minimum. So basically, Subag's theorem says that in particular, whenever you don't have an overlap, then uh, you can achieve the true minimum. When you have an overlap, this algorithm will get stuck at this value where the true minimum will be even smaller. But, uh, but if you don't have an overlap, then it will achieve the true minimum. And now we're going to sketch the proof. So before we, I mean, because this, this expression, at least to me, looks a little bit mysterious, let's see why at least it makes sense in the simplest case that we can think of where the, you know, just uh, uh, when, when there is only uh, gamma two is one and all of the rest are zero. So it's just a random matrix. Yes. Remaining when we ask for the overlap gap or not. What? What parameter are remaining when we ah good, great question. Yes. The, the, the vector gamma. So the vector gamma determines the this polynomial, uh, this polynomial new. And uh, and and for different gammas, uh, different gammas uh, that uh, it would be um, depend it would depend. And just uh, intuitively. Um, if gamma if gamma two is one and the rest are zeros, this is just a matrix and there is no overlap gap. If gamma three is one, or if say gamma two is zero and one of the others is one, then this is like a pure uh, p spin where for p larger or equal to three and there is an overlap gap. So intuitively, the condition is something like gamma two some sense dominates the others. So it can be shown that say if gamma two equals zero, then there will definitely be an overlap gap. And in some sense, there is, uh, the, the condition of the problem being easy is that in some sense, the, the, co the combination of the two parts somewhat dominates the, the others to some extent. And then, uh, yes. To some extent, although I think like in, in, in this case, I don't know if it's like full replica, I mean, uh, symmetry breaking because this is just the eigenvalue. So it's like also it's either like replica symmetric or full replica symmetry breaking. I'm not, if I may, I'm not sure it's, it's relatable there because you could full replica symmetry breaking, if I'm not mistaken, means that, that the, the, the overlap distribution has continued part in the support. But that might include the case of overlap gap or not. So it could be interval versus not interval, and that's what determines whether there is a gap. Uh, Non-full replica symmetric breaking means that the support is discrete set of points. So yeah, so sorry, so, so, so my might... understanding of physics. Okay, so, so 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 yeah, there might be some kind of I don't know if there is an intermediate situation where you have disjoint clusters, but then within within them you have like full replica symmetry breaking, which maybe. Uh, would be a case where you have a gap. The problem is hard, but uh, I don't know what they would call it. So, uh, so let us say no overlap gap, uh, easy overlap gap, hard. And I guess like full replica symmetry breaking or not, like kind of complicated. Yeah. So maybe there are different scenarios. If, I, I'm not sure if what they call exactly FRSB. If uh, so. So I'm not completely sure whether there, like some of those scenarios, you could have a FRSB with a gap, and if you do, then uh, then then it will still be hard. 
And I guess that would be a situation where you first break into these joint clusters, but then in, in each one of them, you have like this uh, ultrametric type of poverty. So, okay, so let's look at this the simplest example where gamma, this is a question when we know this, the problem is supposed to be easy, right? When gamma uh, is just a vector one in the, the, the coordinate, so gamma two equals one and the rest are zero. So, and then uh, this, um, this, this polynomial is simply Q squared and it's the second derivative uh, is simply the two. So now this, this uh, in this case, J of X is simply, you know, uh, you, apply, uh, extend, you apply the quadratic form to this matrix, uh, to this matrix J and to, uh, it's easier for us to see, to work with symmetric matrices. So because XI XJ is equal to XJ XI, it will be the same if we take the average of J and J uh, transpose. So this is the same as applying uh, the, the quadratic form of J plus J transpose over two. Now what is J, and so let's just call this matrix A. So if I is different from J, then um, basically we are looking at, uh, right, each coefficient here, right, uh, each coefficient here is like N01. If you look at half uh, N01, then the variance is squared. So this will be N04, uh, sorry, one over N. So that will be one over four N, and then you add two of them, then you'll get one over two N. So for i different than j, aij is distributed like normal with variance one over two n. When uh, when i is equal to j, then this is the uh, aii. You you looking at just uh, two times and uh, two times the same normal. So you get uh, so so now uh, you get n zero one over n. Okay, this is uh, right. So. If X is distributed like N zero uh, one over N, then uh, X, X plus X over two is just X. And, um, and if X and Y are independent N uh, zero one over N, then uh, X plus Y uh, equals two is distributed like N zero one over two N. Okay, so once we do that, then, uh, then we can see that A is just a one over square root two times A prime, where A prime is distributed according to the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. So uh, if a, a, a Gaussian orthogonal ensemble is just basically when A prime IJ for the I different than J is like N zero one over N and A prime II is N zero two over N. And it's well known that the, the spectrum of the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble is, can ranges between minus two and plus two. So the smallest one in particular is minus two. So the minimum eigenvalue of A will be uh, one over square root two times the minimum eigenvalue of, uh, of A prime, which will be minus square root two. And that's a good thing because uh, uh, obviously the uh, minus the integral from zero one of square root two is minus square root two. So this is what we wanted. So at least we get that uh, this algorithm, it's the, 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 the least good way of finding maybe the minimum eigenvector of a random matrix, but at least uh, we get that get, we get the right answer. So, uh, so at least we get some intuition why this expression at least sometimes makes sense. Okay. So now, uh, Let's discuss the algorithm. So uh, uh, the algorithm is, is the following. We initialize x0 to be uh, just the all zeros vector. And then we do the following thing. We take one over eta squared steps and eta will be some parameter just will set to zero uh, to, you know, to get our accuracy. So think of it as a very small constant. And we'll take uh, ut is going to be um, a unit vector that is uh, in the following uh, subspace. So, okay, so, so now it's going to be the following thing. We take the Hessian of J at X T minus one. So, uh, and we take the mini bottom eigenspace of that. 
and we intersect it with the uh, things that are orthogonal to u1 till ut minus one, all the vectors we had so far, and also the gradient of j at x t minus one. Now the bottom space of this Hessian, generally, if we are willing to fudge a little bit and maybe not exactly the bottom, but some, uh, lose some epsilon accuracy, then its dimension is going to be linear. So, and this is only a constant number of vectors. We can find the vector uh, that is uh, in that subspace and also orthogonal to uh, you know, this constant number of remaining ones. Okay, so we find a vector that basically has uh, the, its correlation with the Hessian is roughly uh, the minimum eigenvalue of this, uh, of this Hessian. And it's also, uh, how do you say, Hessian or Hessian? Okay. I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll use both so that I'm at least right 50% of the time. And, and, uh, and so you will find a vector that its correlation with the Hessian is um, uh, about its minimum eigenvalue. And it's also orthogonal to all the vectors we chose before, plus also the gradient. OK? And kind of if it's a kind of a randomish matrix, uh, it should be the, the spectrum should be kind of continuous. So you would. Uh, yeah, so if you're willing to lose a little bit of epsilon accuracy, you still have a plenty of dimension to be uh, orthogonal to these vectors. And now we just uh, here we, uh, and now we just update. We let x t be x t minus one minus eta times u t this vector, and we end up by outputting the final vector that we get. Like so, with t from one till one over eta squared. So we outputting x one over eta squared, which is the same as a uh, right minus the minus is actually not going to change that but let's skip it so it looks like gradient descent uh, minus eta times uh, t uh, the sum from t equals zero to one minus uh, over eta squared of ut so this is the algorithm now we just want to analyze it and let's just make sure that we output a, a vector of the right norm so because all of these vectors are orthogonal we chose it by design then uh, each one of them has norm, et, uh, norm eta. The, they are all orthogonal. So uh, one over eta squared uh, uh, orthogonal vectors, each of them is of norm eta. They, their sum has norm one. And this is actually kind of important for us that we are able to take one over eta squared steps. Uh, just on the intuition, we, we are able to take one over eta squared steps and uh, to get a norm one vector, even though each one of them is of norm eta. And that's to some extent why we are able to use Hessian rather than gradient and still get something that makes sense. Okay, so now we want to analyze it. So uh, using the Taylor, we know that if we add like a small vector to uh, X, then uh, we get something like uh, the contribution is like the, you know, the dot product of a gradient of this and the, the, the you know, the correlation, the quadratic form of, uh, applied to the Hessian uh, uh, with a, a half, right? This is just Taylor approximation. And uh, by design, we had our vector was orthogonal to uh, the gradient. So the second, so this part is meaningless. So basically what we are going to win in each step, we are going to win a uh, half times uh, eta, eta squared because the uh, right u transpose uh, uh, we, we are going to use uh, our vector u in step t the vector u is going to be eta times uh, ut so we are going to win uh, win in sense in, in the sense of decreasing the objective half eta squared times the minimum eigenvalue of the hessian at this step so uh, or maybe this is t minus one, doesn't really matter. T or t minus one, let's keep it t for simplicity. So by kind of symmetry and concentration, these are all random things. So, uh, the, uh, you know, J is kind of spherically symmetric. So it really, uh, what we expect to be the minimum eigenvalue really only will depend on the norm of XT and not the particular vector because uh, the distribution on J is spherically symmetric. And we are only going to do this to look at this uh, minimum eigenvalue for a constant number of steps. So it's all concentrates very well. So we can just uh, look at the minimum. Uh, so we can just look at the, what we expect to be the minimum uh, eigenvector, eigenvalue of the Hessian of J evaluated 
at the vector that is like say just uh, the norm of xt and z was everywhere else. So this is just what we rotated xt to some nice form. So the point is that the, the minimum eigenvalue really only depends on the norm of xt, it doesn't depend on the particular direction because j is spherically symmetric and we expect these things to be very, very well concentrated. That's good. Again, comments, questions are good. So let's just define this lambda. So I'll just define, uh, uh, I basically I'm going to define uh, lambda of, uh, uh, so, so I'll just call it, uh, this is lambda, uh, la lambda of the norm, right? So the, the norm of xt is going to be uh, eta times uh, square root t. So just define lambda of, uh, I don't know what to call it, lambda of uh, a, to be a lambda mean of uh, or the expectation, if you want, uh, or the mean uh, of uh, of the Hessian at uh, applied the vector alpha uh, a and the rest is zeros. And I'll I'll just call this lambda of square root q, where q is uh, q is just eta squared t. And the reason I use the parameterize it with Q is because eta squared T ranges from zero to one, right? We call, this is basically the norm squared. Uh, Q is going to be the norm squared of, uh, of the XT's vector and it starts at zero, it ends at one. And, it's, uh, and, and it's, it increases uniformly. So uh, if we were to, uh, to think of eta as kind of infinitesimal, then uh, DQ is eta squared. So, if we, uh, so basically, uh, what we win, we said is uh, we, we win at each step uh, half times eta squared times this uh, lambda of square root q. So, if we take F eta to be infinitesimal, what we win is uh, the integral from zero to one of half times lambda of square root q times dq. So now, basically, what we need to prove is that this lambda of uh, lambda mean of this thing is uh, is equal to uh, in expectation or with high probability these things all concentrate to two times the square root of uh, the second derivative of a new a new on q. And now this is just calculations. So basically, uh, you know what is the Hessian? Just open this up. You know, you get this contribution from the second moment thing, uh, contribution from the third thing, etc. And now you just kind of add it up. And I think I'll just go because we're starting to run out of time. I'll, I'll just kind of go quickly. And you, you just do the math, and uh, and and it just uh, you know, just basically is going to be. Uh, you just do the math. It's going to be some coefficients. Some uh, it's going to turn out that this Hessian is is just a random matrix. That is some coefficient times a random matrix that comes from the GOE, and it, the coefficient is exactly what you need it to be. This uh, so the slides will be shared, but, but the, the, this is just math. Okay, so how much time do I have? Okay, so um, okay, so that's good. So, so if we just so so that was just a, basically what we have seen now, is uh, that we if we uh, the solution is uh, the solution solution landscape or overlap gap, kind of characterizes uh, in this regime. In, in this regime, basically uh, the the solution uh, landscape kind of characterizes where the problem is uh, supposed to be easy and hard, when we don't have an overlap. When we don't, when we, we don't have an overlap gap, we expect the problem to be easy when it it appears, and there might be some kind of more uh, in some in some cases maybe there is some kind of in, the, in this dynamic regime where you might have to define the overlap gap a little bit more sensitively because uh, you have this exponential number of clusters that not necessarily show up in the in the overlap, but but generally speaking, the solution landscape. Uh, can uh, characterize for us the difference between uh, easy and hard. So, uh, so in this regime, we kind of understand things, but here 
there is no landscape. So we need to try to find different ways to understand when things become easy or hard. And, and one example to show the difference between the two models is this sherrington kirkpatrick model. So in the sherrington kirkpatrick model, let's say the x-axis, uh, so what is the sherrington kirkpatrick Maybe I should say that because, uh, so the sherrington kirkpatrick model, let's say J, you know, J comes from the Gaussian uh, orthogonal ensemble, and we look at J of X is just X transpose JX. And, uh, and generally, maybe I should say, yes. So generally, let's say the X here is minus alpha. So this is basically the, uh, how the minimum value. So this, this is basically uh, one to try to look at X transpose. Uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> is that mine? Sorry, oops. Hopefully it will stop. <laughs> so and so um, so we, we look at the X transpose a. We look at uh, X transpose J X, uh, or minus X transpose J X, and we're trying to uh, you know uh, maximize minus X transpose J X or minimize X transpose J X. So the two uh, over, uh, over the hypercube, yes, over the hypercube. So the true maximum, so so yes, so the true uh, the true maximum of minus uh, the true uh, maximum of minus j x transpose j x is going to be. This is a famous uh, theory, famous result of Parisi that later confirmed by Talagrand, something like minus uh, one point fifty three. While in the, uh, by looking at the maximum eigenvalue of this orthogonal ensemble, as we can uh, as we can have shown, you can show that it's not larger than two. And this so uh, so you definitely above two, it's easy to refute. We can certify that you cannot get better than two, and up to one point four fifty three is the actual truth. And uh, Montanari showed that basically all the way up to 1.53 uh, that uh, you, can, you can achieve. So basically for this particular problem, this regime, this doesn't exist. So this regime doesn't exist. There is no uh, hard search regime. We, you, can, you, can efficiently find, uh, you can efficiently find an algorithm all the way up to the ground, uh, uh, all the way up to the, to the tooth. But this doesn't mean that this regime doesn't exist. The fact that this hard computationally hard regime doesn't exist doesn't mean that this computationally hard regime doesn't exist. And in fact, we believe it does. So there is a number of, uh, uh, and I wanted to fill out the, all the results. And I know there are also some, I think some recent ones that maybe haven't yet come out. And um, so some, some, there, there is definitely some several works Prasad, did you have a work on that? Uh, Mark, did you have a work on that? Like, uh, or, okay, so, okay, there are, both, both, there are works showing, uh, giving evidence that this two is potentially the two uh, threshold. So there is some partial evidence that saying maybe this is really the two uh, threshold, computational threshold. So basically right now, the, what we believe is that this regime doesn't exist, but this does exist. So basically, it is hard to it is hard to certify, and similar and similarly with planted, it will be hard to recover a planted signal uh, here. Even though uh, Alex, you must have worked on that, right? Yes. With whom? Uh, Alfonso Bandera and Tim Quinnesky. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so would you like to tag in? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so there, are, there is evidence, and you would say that's that's a good conjecture, right? That uh, there is evidence that this part, that this would be hard, both for planted and for uh, refutation, right? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by planted, but for refutation, yes. For um, refutation, and, and and I guess there, there might be, it should be a way to plant a signal in the uh, uh, like plant a, a boolean spike so that it will be hard to recover, like say 1.6 or 1.7. There's a way to plant it so that it's hard all the way up. Yes. But it's sort of a special way. To plant. Yeah, you have to be, all, all of those ways, when you plant, you have to plant intelligently. But, uh, but there is a way to plant it so that, the, uh, so basically refutation and, and planting would be hard. 
so so basically the fact that the uh, so the fact that this regime uh, so so having this part this regime doesn't the fact that this doesn't exist doesn't mean that this part doesn't exist and this can sometimes be confusing so if you're like a physicist and you just look at uh, at this part you could say ah this problem is computationally solved but uh, if you're uh, you know if you're just interested in inference for example in recovering a, a signal then you might say okay this this part this left part doesn't interest me because this is basically what you've said that you can recover the noise so basically this is a so, so this kind of motivates our looking at the refutation problem. So the refutation problem is to certify that the minimum uh, is at least some beta. And you could care like why, you know, refutation generally is not the most natural problem. So you could say, why do you even care about refutation? Uh, after all, you know, uh, proving things is something that somehow only mathematicians care about. And everyone knows that uh, mathematicians are not important, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, Otherwise, why do we need to, uh, you yeah, know, everyone, I mean, we know we are not important also, right? Uh, that's why <laughs> we're just, why, I mean, between ourselves, we know that we're not important. We just don't tell it to them. This is, I, I, this is taken from my uh, slides deck uh, for my startup. That's I guess I, I guess maybe that's the reason why I never got funded. <laughs> <laughs> so, so 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 basically, one, one reason to care about refutation, aside from uh, proving things, is that um, uh, that if you show that refutation is hard, maybe showing refutation is easy, it's not clear what it's interesting for, but if you show that it's hard, then it also implies that decision is hard and hypothesis testing is something natural. And the other thing is really that refutation threshold it tends it basically is the same threshold as the planted uh, recovery or the inference uh, problem, at least if you, uh, for the harder version of the planted, the, if you plant properly. And, uh, and inference is really the part that we do care about. So, so we really do have this intuition that basically uh, the refutation phase well, it says basically when the recovery becomes computationally easy versus computationally hard. And the intuition is that we think of our data as signal plus noise. And when we, when we are able to refute the noise, when we are able to, to say that uh, the noise couldn't have contributed to the objective, then we can recover the, the signal. And, and, and here is kind of like, how do we do this uh, planting? So uh, generally planting can be complicated, but like in the P-spin things, it's fairly simple. You want to generate some J star to ensure that the minimum is, uh, is this planted signal X star. So for three XO, the most natural thing to do is you just generate constraints that are consistent with this X star. So you're saying, you know, you have an either plus or minus, a random j would have a, be either plus or minus here. It's uh, you know it's either zero when there is no constraint or plus or minus. And here you'd say it's always going to be the thing that ensures that x star is the minimizer. So this is kind of the noiseless version to apply it, and you can also have like a noisy version, and uh, to ensure that Gaussian elimination doesn't uh, work, and so where you add a little bit of noise, but this noise can be really small to already kill Gaussian elimination. And there is the spike tensor model where you think of, say, uh, Gaussian coefficients and, and, and you just take a random, uh, you know, J prime to be like, say, random normals, and then you add lambda times uh, X times your signal. So this lambda here is very natural to think about it as the signal to noise ratio. And you can really also think of a delta, the number of constraints you expose as also the signal to noise ratio. Uh, or say the number of samples you observe if you're doing inference. So this is basically the sparse parity, three sparse parity with noise problem, right? Uh, this version. And, uh, and basically the uh, delta is like the number of samples we observe. And, and generally, this is my intuition, which I think, I hope that eventually we'll have more formal way. But my intuition is that kind of the way to merge these system, these two views, is that there is some quantity that's kind of like the refutation entropy, some upper bound of this red curve, which is kind of the feasible, the, 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 the computationally certifiable upper bound of this red curve. 
And there is some regime, which I don't know exactly how long it lasts, where uh, this is tight. And then at some point, uh, you cannot certify a, a tight upper bound up until the refutation threshold where uh, you can certify it. And then basically, this is the point where uh, things become easy. So that's kind of my intuition, but I don't think yes, yet we have works to, uh, to show that. And, and, but the thing, the, the, maybe the most powerful refutation type of algorithm that uh, we have is this uh, sum of squares algorithm. Uh, uh, now I'm sure, uh, Perillo and Lasserre. And, and, and I'll just kind of do a slide. I will think we'll see more maybe in Passat's talk about sum of squares, but I'll kind of just do a slide uh, on, on sum of squares. So we want to certify that the minimum is at least beta. How do you do that? Here is a way to do that. So J is just a polynomial. So you write J as beta plus another polynomial that is a sum of squares. What does it mean a sum of squares? Sum of squares, polynomial that is a sum of squares. It can never be negative. So this really certifies that J is always at least beta. And if you're working, uh, and, and if you're only interested in X, say in the Boolean cube, then uh, you don't need it J to be equal uh, to beta plus SOS X uh, everywhere. It's enough for it to be equal only on the Boolean cube, which means basically you can uh, say this is, this is equality of polynomials, but you mod out by uh, any polynomial that is a multiple of, a, of something that uh, vanishes on the, say, the Boolean cube. So if it was the Boolean cube plus minus one, then the, this polynomial vanishes it on, on it, xi squared minus one. If you're working on the sphere, then this is the polynomial that vanishes on it. So basically, you, uh, you only need the, the certificate to show that you, you're equal over the domain you're interested in. And the complexity of a sum of squares proof is the degree of this SOS polynomial. And, and then generally, uh, if you look at the set of all polynomials of degree at most D and N variables that uh, are a sum of squares, then uh, a, convex a, a convex combination of a sum of squares uh, is, a convex, uh, is also a sum of squares. So this is a convex subset of our N to the D, the roughly N to the D coefficients, maybe a little bit more, who cares, something like that. And it has a separation oracle because this is basically like uh, checking uh, eigenvalues. It's, it's like you can embed those as positive semi-definite matrices. So you can optimize over that. Uh, so using a semi-definite programming, you can optimize that in time and to the O of D. So that's, uh, so degree captures the time complexity to optimize. And when you have this, uh, when, whenever you have like a, a convex optimization, you also have duality. So the dual object for uh, this certificate would be a linear operator that takes a polynomial and outputs a number. And we call it this degree D pseudo expectation operator. And the, and the conditions we want from it is that E of one equals one. And again, if it was an expectation, the expectation of one should be one. If a polynomial Q, P is in the ideal, it vanishes over the domain, then E of P times Q should be, uh, should be zero. So in some sense, uh, you know, if it's supposed to vanish, it should vanish. And uh, E of P squared should be non-negative. Uh, expectation of a squared should be non-negative. So it satisfies the conditions of an expectation, but uh, it's only defined up to degree D. And, uh, and for natural S, such so S like the sphere or the cube, up to some accuracy, basically degree a constant times n pseudo expectation means that it's an actual expectation. And there is kind of an easy claim to show that the, the side of one side of this duality is that if there is such a pseudo expectation and it's satisfied that the expectation of j is less than b, then you're never going to certify using the degree d sum of squares certificate that uh, you're never going to certify that, uh, you know, so even if the, you know, maybe the minimum is really larger than beta, but if there is an, uh, an pseudo expectation that pretends that the minimum is smaller than beta, you're not going to have the greedy certificate. And, and the, the, the proof is kind of immediately immediate. So, you know, if you, if you take the expectation of the certificate, then uh, this condition implies that this part is negative and expectation of beta is just beta. So, uh, 
So if there was a certificate, then for every degree D pseudo expectation, it will have to be the case that the uh, expectation of J is at least beta. And that in particular means that if D is roughly N, then, uh, then the certificate is actually the, 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 the on, you can only certify it if it's true. And you can, if it's really true that the minimum of J of X is at least better, you can certify it because, uh, uh, because the, in this case, there is an actual expectation if and only if the minimum is, uh, if and only if the minimum is, uh, uh, is at least better. Okay, so, okay, maybe I'll, uh, because I think we're running out of time, I'll not talk about pseudo calibration. And kind of jump to uh, the of the high level uh, point. So basically, for uh, PXOs, for example, we have a refutation uh, threshold that is about when we have uh, so we have about n constraints, say roughly n if it's noise then uh, there is no no longer uh, the the random constraint satisfaction is no longer, uh, there, there is no longer a random solution. So if you are the planted solution, the planted solution is only the one that remain. So information theoretically, it's possible to solve the say P parity with noise problem at a roughly N uh, samples, but we need something like N to the P over two samples to actually show, uh, solve it effect effectively. And while we, my, my dream picture of a refutation entropy, we don't know exactly how to do it, but if at least in this kind of regime, ignore this part, which is very speculative, but at least in this part of regime, if instead of uh, thinking of as an entropy, you'd think of it as the log of the runtime to refute, then it, there is such a curve like that, that Slil and uh, Passad and others have, uh, and Ryan O'Donnell have kind of shown uh, that there is evidence that we have this kind of smooth curve where uh, you can refute here, but it's not in polynomial time, it will be in kind of sub exponential time. And, and yeah, and, 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 and uh, SOS is not the only kind of algorithm for, say, inference and planting, but it has some advantages. It can simulate many of these other algorithms, and it's very general. It's such as, the SOS program writes itself. It doesn't analyze itself right now, but at least uh, but it's kind of obvious what the program is uh, for uh, at least for refutation. Uh, so uh, you don't need creativity. Uh, like we said, we want to automate creativity. You don't need creativity in the algorithm design. Uh, and, it, uh, and maybe the most important thing is that it extends, all of this talk was about random problems, but in real life, we also care a lot about this kind of robust setting or adversarial setting where uh, maybe then uh, we have some random inputs, but some of them, uh, like we also have maybe arbitrary errors and SOS kind of naturally extend to this thing. And the main disadvantage is that although SOS is polynomial time, it's not really efficient in, in practice, but there's been a lot of work by Slil, Sam, and many others on making uh, transforming SOS algorithms into uh, efficient. And did I completely run out of time? I'm personally happy for you to continue all evening. Uh, I mean, but no, truly. So, uh, yeah. so I mean, I'm happy for everyone to leave if they need to. I can just say maybe uh, I can take maybe uh, three more minutes Absolutely, to say yeah. uh, the difference between uh, like uh, to talk a little bit about modern machine learning versus uh, these kind of notions of inference and a little bit more speculative. So. So basically what's like, I mean, inference is kind of uh, is the focus of this workshop and focus of what we're doing, but what's the difference between that and what people do in modern machine learning is where they solve non-convex opt uh, optimization. And let me say what I think, see as difference, I'm not sure if that's universally agreed. So the way I see it is inf in inference problems, you have data and you invent some generative model that you believe that generated this data. So in Adam Cliven's talk, the generative model maybe was, uh, you know, RBM or uh, Ising model or whatever. And, and then you want to recover the parameters of that model. And in practice, why do you want to recover the parameters to do, uh, so, so you do run some optimization. Let's say you're trying to uh, maximize the probability. And why do you want to recover the parameters? You're going to do some task with these parameters. 
But that's kind of outside the model. You we first you cover the parameters. Once you do that, you kind of understood the data and you could do a lot of things with it. And in kind of model, model machine learning, we, we get data. We don't want to talk about a generative model. We don't know. And we want an algorithm that will give us parameters, but not really parameters from the data, but parameters to whatever we are going to do the task with. And our optimization will be the success of the task. So we don't have a generative model of the, the data. We just want to find something uh, that will help us do the task. And the difference between X and theta is that, uh, like typically in, in inference, the theta is very clean, fixed model for the data. And here we have a lot of freedom of what to choose X as. And the key differences, maybe uh, if you compare this machine learning view with inference, is the following. So on one hand, the um, loss function, in here, even here, it's kind of often will be non-convex and very complicated, but, but this is kind of clean and analyzable, or at least you can write it as in math. Here, the loss function, and especially once you start to do like the you know, loss functions uh, that are used for self-supervised learning or for, uh, I don't know, reinforcement learning or whatever, they, they could be very, very complicated loss function. So that in principle makes, seems to make the problem computationally harder. But the key thing that we have that could make the problem computationally easier is that we have complete freedom of the choice of representation. And we uh, generally, we look at much more data potentially than uh, what we could have, we would have needed in the minimal case. Uh, and the freedom in the loss of representation is in the choice of representation is actually often important in terms of making the problem easy. For example, if we talk about supervised learning, often it's the case that say, uh, the, the number of parameters you have is so big that if someone asks you, just use those parameters to build the lookup table, to implement a lookup table so that uh, it will fit the train data pre uh, perfectly, it would be very simple computationally to do. So this is not, sometimes people say, wow, it's amazing that uh, in machine learning you solve NP hard problems. It's actually very trivial uh, to solve the training problem. What is surprising is that you solve the training problem and the, it actually works uh, beyond training. But uh, the, the computational, the fact that you find an, a minimum for the training is not very surprising uh, because basically what uh, you know it amounts to, I uh, say, you know, if I if I gave you a, a list of uh, ten thousand uh, pairs and I, and, and I gave you, you know, enough freedom that you could just write a lookup table, uh, you can encode the lookup table in this neural network, it's not hard to do. So, uh, uh, but the key similarity between inference and, and this machine learning is that you still use, even in ML, et cetera, you end up using gradient descent, you use the same local algorithms. So something here is similar. And empirically, there is this thing that basically you are doing this sequence of local steps, local improvements, and, and there is, seems to be this thing that basically, as long as you somehow didn't saturate performance, you didn't run out of uh, fuel, you can find some local improvement such that uh, two things happen. First of all, it, it performs better on the observed data. So you can run gradient descent and keep optimizing on your training data. You can find some modification, say gradient step, et cetera, that uh, improves your performance on the training set. And also empirically, uh, this, the, each one of those steps, not just at the very end, but each one of those steps will improve your performance even on unseen data until you run out of fuel. And the way you want to make sure that you don't run out of fuel, that you saturate later, is you generally use more data and bigger models. So the bigger your models, the, the more your data, generally it kind of delays the point of time and which one of those things stops to be true. Uh, so at some point, uh, you know, if your model is too small, at some point you're not going to be able to continue to do better on observed data. And if your data is not enough, then at some point you're not going to, you, you stop doing better on unseen data. But the more you have of these resources, the better you are. And I just wanted to kind of add like this, uh, show this slide of this deep wood stuff that we uh, work of uh, Pritum Nakiran as my student and Beishabur uh, and Seji that had these nice ways where they tracked what happens uh, in the real world where you uh, do on a, tra a training, uh, you, you take steps on a, a fixed set of data 
and what would have happened in a, an ideal world where you'd had infinitely amount of fresh data. And basically they showed that at least until you saturate, these things track each other very well. Like where, how you, uh, every step you do, you, 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 whether it's with, with this limited data or with infinite data, it kind of improves, uh, it, it, it kind of improves um, in a similar way. And I don't have time to explain this more, but I'm happy to talk about it later. So let me just finish with this last slide that basically we, what we've seen in, and I think this, hopefully this semester will help put this picture in, in more is that you know, we, we have a collection of natural algorithms and they all seem to say, face barrier in more or less the same locations. And I think we have seen the evidence that this is really inherent, but there is still more work to do and in particular, I think the, the thing that bothers me is that basically we still have a need to write a new paper every time we consider a new problem or a new algorithm. Where, uh, the, uh, and also this difference, the, the, there are these two different regimes that we, I really hope we will be able to unify them eventually. And so, we, and, and the hope is that eventually we'll get the case to the case where you describe a, a problem like uh, by say an average case problem using a generative model, and immediately uh, you could run, you know, you could run a pro computer program that will tell you, here is where all the thresholds will be, and here is the what the optimal algorithm will do uh, in all of the regimes. And uh, with that, I'm very sorry for taking more of your time, uh, and uh, that's it. Thank you. So there probably is time for maybe a couple of quick questions and then we have a reception at which you can continue to ask Boaz more questions. Is there a, can you make a more formal or generic connection between refutation and uh, planted and solving uh, the planted search? And you, you, you alluded many times to the right. same problem, but is there some uh, reduction there or some? So I think maybe some of these proof to uh, so 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 there's definitely I think certain sense in which you have this uh, uh, proof to uh, algorithm uh, type of framework where at least if you can refute you can recover uh, and and that I think is is, is somewhat generic or formal would you say that Sam or? Uh, um, with, I think I think I think with enough assumptions on what kind of model you're in, you know these these generic these these simple toy models have some kind of signal plus noise structure in the planted settings, and I think with enough assumptions on how signal and noise go together, you can probably show, uh, yeah, so, something like you know refuting being able to up, you know re refuting recovering and optimizing are all going to be corners of some triangle, and they probably are. Like definitely optimizing is good enough for refuting. Anyway, we could talk about it offline. Yeah. But, but I, I mean, there is like this proper, proof to... proper reductions, reductions. I actually don't think so unless there's like a lot of assumptions. But maybe for particular kinds of algorithms, you could say, well, if this kind of algorithm does this, then this kind of algorithm can do this too. I'm not exactly sure. But the, but the kind of general idea of like proof to uh, recovery is kind of a case where you you look at an identifiability proof, which often is in its heart uh, also implies a refutation of the random part and and that in uh, and that identifiability proof is then uh, some sometimes you can kind of almost automatically translate it into an a uh, recovery algorithm but uh, i think it's uh, yeah not not as formal uh, as we would like or, or general yes um, so in the start of your talk, you mentioned that there's actually very few algorithmic paradigms that we apply to lots of problems. Mm -hmm. um, just out of curiosity, does Subarg's algorithm fall into one of these? Yes, areas? basically it's an uh, approximate message passing. Uh, Subarg, uh, Montanari, uh, 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 Montanari circuit, they're all uh, approximate message passing algorithms, which are basically local uh, algorithms. Thank you. Awesome, so thanks again. We have our sort of picture of the camp reception just outside. So.
Thank you.